Hi there. That you're watching this video right now tells me that you're at least curious about or maybe even committed to becoming a better communicator or a better presenter, maybe even a better public speaker. Great. You're in the right place at the right time. Here's why. Public speaking or effective communication skills are one of the most sought after skills in the entire professional and business world. The ability to stand up in front of a group of people of any size and compel them to action is one of the most powerful forms of influence on earth today. It's extremely valuable and it's a skill that's absolutely worth developing. And so I'm really glad you're here right now because I'm going to share with you three core things that can help you take your presentations and make them better, make them more influential and make them more engaging for the audiences. Are you in? Are you ready? Because here we go with part one. Part one is about rapport. It's about connecting with an audience as quickly as possible. Let's take a backward step first. Why? Why do we want to connect with them so quickly? And also, why is connecting with them so important? So in order to answer that, I think we need to get a time machine. And we need to go back hundreds of thousands of years. And we need to imagine early humans sitting around the fire. Remember, they didn't have Netflix and iTunes, right? How did they learn? How did they share their history? How did they teach each other? They did it through stories. And so as a result, we humans love both to tell and to hear great stories. It's in our nature. And so when a presenter, when somebody gets up to do a talk and they figure out how to get quick rapport with an audience, they are invoking something magical. And that is the instinctive desire of an audience to be an audience. It starts, however, with rapport. Rapport is effectively a sense of resonance with the audience. It's what keeps them in the story. If you imagine, for example, what it's like to go to a movie where something happens in the movie that takes you out of the story, some really terrible wasted digital special effect that really just didn't work very well or some bad acting or something that just violates the laws of physics. It takes you out of the story for that moment. In other words, the movie breaks rapport with you. Well, a public speaker can do the exact same thing. The first key is to establish a really good connection with the audience. And in order to do that, we need to understand who that audience is. So first of all, it means understanding some of the demographics of the audience. Like, where are you geographically? What industry are you speaking in? What are some common themes that are interesting to your entire audience? When you know you're giving a talk, whether it's for four people, 40 people, 400 people, you want to know who it is you're speaking to and figuring out what are their common concerns so that you can weave them into your talk and maybe even address those concerns for them. Now, the next step is recognizing that they all speak in different languages. I don't mean German, English, French, Italian, Swedish, and Norwegian. I mean that there are three core languages that people speak. And some people are bilingual and some people are trilingual and some people speak only one. These are the languages, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. What this means is some people like a really fast communication. They talk fast and they, they're loud and there's a lot of passion in their voice and intensity. These people are often what we refer to as visual people. The reason that we refer to them as visual is that they kind of think in pictures. And since a picture is worth a thousand words, they talk really quickly and intensely, painting all the colors. Here's the problem. Visual people do not generally have great rapport with people at the other end of the spectrum that are more kinesthetic or feeling-centered people. These people prefer slower, more considered, deliberate communication with punctuated pauses and time to reflect. And those people have almost no rapport with the visual people. And in the middle, you've got a group of people who like their words to be pronounced clearly. And they like there to be a rhythm and a cadence to the presentation so that it is easy to follow and predictable. And those people are more sound oriented or what we would call auditory in nature. The challenge is there are some speakers who are truly only monolingual. They walk out on their stage and they're all about passion and motivation and excitement. And what's going to happen if they do that is about two thirds of the audience is going to get up and leave. And if they are too polite to get up and leave, they're going to take out their phone and they're going to start doing something else. They're not going to be present to the message. On the other hand, someone might come in and be very halting and quiet and talk about feelings. And some of the audience is going to love them. But about two thirds of the audience are going, hey, when is this going to even start? And so what we want to do to really create rapport with an audience is find out how to speak in all three of those languages. That's the first step. How can you speak in all three of those languages? Here's how you can do it right now. Before you even do a presentation, before you even stand in front of an audience, 
Go out with your friends, have dinner with them, and tell stories like you normally do, only with one difference. Expand your range. Try being louder and faster than you normally are. Try being quieter, slower, more deliberate, more contemplative than you normally are. And expand that range so that you can see how many of those languages that you can get to in a single story and how often you can move between them. Creating a roller coaster ride of experience for your audience or for your friends in this case as you're telling the story. This one skill can change everything for many speakers. And believe me, you already know this, don't you? Haven't you been there where you've seen a talk where the speaker is just droning on and on and on. And frankly, rather than being a speaker, they should be an airline attendant telling you that in case the cabin depressurizes, oxygen masks will drop from the ceiling. To buckle your seatbelt, I mean, seriously? We've all been to a talk like that, where somebody's completely monotone, picking one language to speak to the audience in and giving them no emotional variety at all. Absolutely no rapport. Any longer than five minutes in one modality like that, you're running the risk of breaking rapport. So to recap, First of all, find out what's in common for your audience and speak to those commonalities. Remember to use all three of the modalities so that you're speaking to the kinesthetic, to the auditory, and to the visual people all throughout your talk. If you just do this one video, if you just do this one part, you can massively transform the way you do presentations. Again, whether these are small presentations for three or four people or massive presentations in front of a television audience, the principles are the same. So. Go home, practice, and take these things on board. Are you ready for part two? All right, part two is about how to construct your presentations. That's right, how to put them together. Let's talk a little bit about why to learn to do this well. First of all, let's not use notes. Really, aren't you most interested when a speaker can just take the stage and speak from their heart and share from the heart without glancing down at paper all the time? I think so. And so what we wanna do is learn to construct talks that allow us to flow our presentations from memory easily so that we don't have to worry about remembering exactly which word goes in which place. The second thing is, is that we want our talks to be flexible. Here's what I mean by flexible. If you are doing public presentations, quite often you might not be the organizer of the event that you're speaking at. In other words, it's possible that the organizer comes to you one day and says, you remember that 45 minute talk you're about to do? Well, we need you to do it in 30 minutes. <laughs> Here's the reaction of most speakers. And I mean some of the most seasoned professional speakers that I know. Here's the reaction. What? What do you mean I have to change it? I've already rehearsed it this way. This is how I remember it. My slides will all be messed up. You can't cut my talk by 15 minutes. I swear they have tantrums. There's only one acceptable answer. If your producer or if the promoter of the event asks you to cut 15 minutes off your talk, and that acceptable answer is no problem. If you've learned to construct your talks in an incredibly organized way, which I'm about to show you, you will be able to shave 15 minutes off your talk without giving it a second thought. And as a result, the producer is going to like working with you. I'm telling you, it's absolutely one of the most powerful things you could learn because the way I'm about to show you to construct talks will make them extremely time flexible so that when somebody tells you you have to stop 10 minutes early or go 10 minutes long, the answer you can give them is no problem, all good ready to go. So are you ready to learn? We're going to use something that we call speech maps. Speech maps. Some of you may be familiar with mind mapping, or if you've worked with Brian Maine, you may have seen goal mapping. Or if you've worked with me in a business environment, you will have heard of role mapping. So now we're going to talk about speech maps. Speech maps are based on the idea that linear memory will simply get you in trouble on stage. Here's what I mean by this. If your talk is memorized in a linear fashion, that is that point A leads to point B leads to point C leads to point D, then the challenge with that is that if you have to remove one of those points, you may have a hard time finding where you were in the whole conversation. Go to any large group of people and just immediately say, what comes after G? <laughs> well, then they're gonna go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, H comes after G because people have a linear memory of the alphabet. What we wanna do is move toward having a map memory of our presentation rather than a linear memory. Think of it this way. If we were to hire Aerosmith to come and do a concert for us right now, Lee and me, let's do it. We'll put it together, big concert, Aerosmith. They're gonna come and play for my birthday in March. And you know what? It's gonna be so cool. We're gonna get them to play for an hour. Now, imagine that we did this, we've booked them and they're on their way. So exciting. Then we say to them, 
you know what, guys, there's been a little double booking. We've got another act coming in. It turns out the Rolling Stones are coming as well. And you need to cut half an hour out of your set. Would that be possible? What do you think they would say? No problem. No problem at all. Because they, walk, they operate from a perspective of sets. Let me say it one more way. Do you think that they would have to rehearse to do the one hour concert for my birthday at all? Absolutely not. They would not have to rehearse because they are not building the concert. They're assembling a set from pre-rehearsed content or songs. In our case, we'll be using stories. We'll be constructing our talk from a series of stories and points that we would like to make. In fact, in part three, I'm going to show you some really cool ways to catalog your stories and develop a database of really exciting stories that you can always use to create a talk on a moment's notice whenever you need to. For now though, imagine that you had a series of stories that you knew very well. And so when somebody asked you to put a talk together, you did it just like Aerosmith or the Rolling Stones would. You say, well, it's a one hour presentation, so I'll put this 10 minute story here, I'll put this 10 minute story there, and I'll put this 15 minute story there, and I've got enough filler between them that that'll last an hour. Now, if somebody comes along and says, hey, you gotta cut that down by half an hour, you look at which stories you can remove or which stories you can tell in a shorter form, making your talk extremely flexible. By the way, if we then went back to Aerosmith and said, ah, oh, Mick and the boys canceled on us. Can you guys play for an extra hour? Well, we might have to negotiate about payment a little, but at the end of the day, they'd add that extra hour on without difficulty at all, because they would simply be adding stuff to the map rather than having to add something to some predetermined linear presentation. So the way we're going to do this is basically by creating a speech map. I'm going to put one up on the screen for you right now. So if you look in the middle of the map, what you'll find is the topic. Then we, the map works in a clockwise fashion. So at the top right hand side, you'll see where the talk begins. It begins with something we call the F15. Something that I'll be showing you if you ever come to one of our live workshops. It's an extremely powerful way to start any presentation so that you absolutely know that you're on track. We call it the F-15 because, you know, an F-15 fighter plane uses a massive amount of its fuel just for the liftoff. In, in fact, for a short flight, it can use as much fuel for the liftoff as it does for the whole flight. And so what we do with our F-15 is put as much effort into that first 15% of a presentation as we do the balance. So you see that there's an F-15 up in that top corner. Then as we move clockwise around, you can see that we're going to tell a story and make a point. Then we're going to tell another story and make a point. We're going to tell another story and make a point. And then we're going to finish with a final story and a final point. And you notice that each of these stories has a long and a short time that I can tell them in. This one's 8 to 12 minutes. This one's 10 to 15 minutes and so on. This means that if you come along and ask me to cut my story or cut my talk down, I can either pick shorter versions of these stories or I could eliminate one story entirely. And I could do that in my mind in a heartbeat without having to change any notes, without even really having to give it much consideration at all. In fact, I could do it on the stage in a moment's notice, and so can you. In fact, if you would like a template of a story map, just write to me on Twitter or Facebook and we'll make sure we get one out to you. We'll get you a template of a story map. It's really easy. And then all you have to do is fill in the blanks and you'll have your story ready to go. Here's the other reason too. Once you create a story map, you just look at it. You look at it and you remember it visually. And when you remember it visually, you're able to look up and say, yes, I know that from here I go to here to go to here. Yes, and then I have this point to make and this story to tell. And it's a really nice way to remember your maps. So to recap, we use stories. And we're going to talk about stories in the next part, how to build them, how to construct them, and how to keep track of them. Then once we've talked about stories, or once you've got some stories, you put them into a map. You put them into a map so that you are telling a story and making a point, telling a story and making a point, because you are now rather more building a set than a speech, which will allow you the flexibility of telling shorter or longer versions of the story, or even deleting or adding stories as you need to change the length of your talk on the fly. This will make you so professional. Are you ready for part three? Part three is all about stories, the magic of stories, how to tell the stories, and how to make sure that the stories are at your fingertips when you need them. Stories are everything. People pay thousands of dollars a year to watch, listen to, and consume stories in books, television, radio, movies, and so on. Studios will produce movies at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. The human condition is to enjoy the telling and the hearing of stories. 
And so if we understand that properly, we can begin to differentiate instantly from truly great presentations and not so great presentations. And one of the most immediate distinguishing differences is this. Not so great presentations are often lectures, simply facts being detailed. Whereas truly great presentations are peppered with stories, compelling, engaging, entertaining stories that also happen to share a point or teach a lesson. So we absolutely want to construct our presentations with the use of powerful stories. That is, if you would like to keep your audience awake and engaged. So let's talk a little bit about stories because one of the questions that I get most often when I do open Q&A with clients about public speaking is, Eric, where do you come up with all the stories? I mean, you've got a story for every situation. How do you do it? And so I'm going to describe to you right now how exactly I do that, if you're interested. It's really, really simple. It's broken into two parts. One is recognizing stories, and two is storing the stories. So recognizing stories is really simple. That is, live your life and notice what is worth repeating. When something happens and you feel compelled to repeat the instance, repeat the story of what happened, you've just discovered a story. You may not know how, why, or where you could use that story in the future, but you definitely have identified a story. Everything that happens in your life that evokes emotion is some kind of a story. By the way, there's a gorgeous side effect of this, and it works like this. Is it true that sometimes, quote, bad things happen? Well, that's a debate. Some people say, no, no bad things happen. Everything happens for me, not to me. Well, I want to tell you that in the moment, things often do feel bad. Once you recognize that every story that happens to you is something you might want to use on stage, you start taking a deeper responsibility for the outcomes of your stories. I'm a big, big fan of recognizing that everything that happens in your life that evokes emotion is a story. Once you begin to recognize that, you will realize that you already have a huge inventory of stories in your life. And you will be creating more and more stories for that inventory as you move into the future. With that in mind, let's talk about how to remember them. Now, I'm going to describe for you how to do this on paper because I did it on paper for so many years. So let's start with paper. The first thing is you get yourself a story journal. A story journal is nothing more than a journal in which you keep stories. And the way it works is you open up a fresh page. Then I'd write bullet points down about that story, what happened, remind myself of the details and so on. And then in the bottom right hand corner, I would write down how long it takes to tell that story. I can tell the story in as short as 90 seconds, or I can tell it in full detail, and it can take 12 to 13 minutes if I really want to drag it out. So I can tell that story in anything from a minute and a half to say 13 to 15 minutes. Then along the bottom of the page, I put a bunch of keywords that relate to that story, adversity, state management, anger, etc. I write those at the bottom of the page. This means that when I'm leafing through my story journal and I'm looking for certain keywords, they're right there at the bottom of the page. Now, imagine you've done this with 20, 30, 100 or more stories. And someone says to you, hey, could you do a talk like in about an hour and you need to talk about this topic? You're like, uh, hang on a second. You take out your story journal and you just start flipping through looking for keywords and you go, I need four stories. I need to fill an hour. Bam, it's done. You can have that entire presentation prepared and ready to deliver in six minutes. Stories are absolutely key to people. They are absolutely key. We love to tell them. We love to hear them. We spend millions and millions of dollars as a society telling and hearing stories. It's in our nature. When you start telling a story, the audience's perception of time can disappear. And when you're telling a story, you have the opportunity to teach directly to them through their filters, teach them at a level that they will really understand and they will really, really, really remember you. So that is the end of part three. And I wanna recap what we've discussed about in all three of these discussions. The first thing is, is that we wanna make sure that we create rapport instantly with the audience and then we maintain it. How do we do that? We recognize that we're looking for commonalities in the audience. What are some things that are common to the entire audience that we can integrate into our talk or address that will create the maximum information rapport with the audience? Then we recall that the audience will be broken up into three categories. People who prefer a louder, faster message, people who prefer a more you know, cadence oriented and voice quality and, and rich message, and then other people that are looking for feeling that really wanna to be touched when you give your presentation. And so what you're gonna do is remember to use all of those modalities in your presentation. Sometimes getting really deep and thoughtful, giving people a chance to digest what you're saying, giving them a chance to 
feel it in their own body. And then there's going to be times where you're going to want to get the story out and give them some rhythm and cadence and predictability. You can, you know, alliteration is always an excellent way to make that stuff happen. And then at peak moments when it's really appropriate, you can step up the volume and get really passionate and excited and create the volume for them that will really move them to action. In the next part, we talked about speech maps. No more linear notes. No more cue cards. No more, no more remembering A, B, C, D. What we're going to do is we're going to construct sets that are easy to change. They're easy to remember, easy to modify on the fly on stage if you need to. Add a story here or subtract a story there. Or tell the five minute version, tell the 15 minute version. And remember, if you would like a template of a speech map, just send us a note on Twitter or Facebook and we'll get one to you. And then lastly, we talked about the power of stories. We talked about a number of things, that your life is a story, that everything that happens in your life that creates emotion for you is a story. And so two things you need to do, recognize those stories, and then you need to record them. I hope you've enjoyed this video training with me. It's been a lot of fun recording it for you. And I really truly hope that we get to meet in person one of these days sooner than later. Good luck until then. Mm -hmm.